Torsten. So as Torsten just uh, said, we're g on this panel going to be focusing mainly on that first bit of the question, why has pay growth been so weak when apparently unemployment has been so low recently? My name is Gemma Tetlow, I'm Chief Economist at the Institute for Government and I am delighted to be joined on my right by Stephen Clark and Paul Gregg, who are the two authors of the paper that Torsten just summarised for you uh, there. So. Uh, Stephen is a senior re economic analyst at the Resolution Foundation and leads their work on the labour market. And Paul Gregg is a professor of economics at the University of Bath. My left but final panelist is Brad Spake. I never know how to pronounce your name. Spagner? Spagner. 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 Okay. Um, Brad is, is from the Bank of England um, and is a senior manager in the Bank of England's Monetary Analysis Division uh, and has worked on inflation and labour market dynamics for the past five years. So the way we're going to run this is Brad's going to start off with a five-minute presentation. I'm then going to ask each of the other two panellists to give five minutes of remarks. We have quite a tight timescale on this, so I'm going to hope everyone sticks to time, and then we'll be able to open it up for about half an hour of Q&A from all of you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to go into a bit more detail on the relationship between pay and unemployment, kind of delving into some of the stuff that Torsten has already touched on. Uh, so starting with the basic data, this kind of puts it into historical context. I think when people refer to instability in the Phillips curve, this is probably the picture that you have in mind. So what we see over time is um, wage, and, uh, wage inflation and unemployment fluctuations have changed over time, subject to instability. Over time, we've seen both pay, growth, and unemployment uh, fluctuate at lower levels and, and the volatility of the fluctuations uh, that we see in pay and unemployment have also fallen. So lots of shifts, lots of twists, flattening of the Phillips curves. You, you don't really have to look hard to find um, shifts in the Phillips curve over time. Zooming into the more recent data, uh, Torsten had, had a similar slide. Uh, what we see in the, mo in the, in the, all the colors have changed from <laughs> once I submitted. Um, what we see in the recent data, is that, as was noted, we had a, a sharp dip in pay growth. This is nominal pay growth here uh, at the start of the crisis, which then remains subdued. And, it, you know, around 2014, when the labor market did start to, start to tighten sharply, it's not as if we didn't see any impact on pay. We did see an impact on pay, uh, especially private sector pay, which is the red line here. Um, and more recently, there's been a bit, bit more of a boost in, in public sector pay. But where we're at currently is that um, nominal pay growth is subdued relative to what it was uh, at the start of the uh, before the crisis. Uh, so this has prompted more discussion about whether or not there's been yet another um, move in the Phillips curve. There are many many factors that can that can shift the Phillips curve uh, over time uh, and complicate the relationship. But one which receives a lot of attention is um, uh, the Nehru or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, so the kind of lowest unemployment rate that the, that the economy can sustain without uh, causing a lot of upward inflation pressure. Um, now, this, this NARO, the natural rate of unemployment, is based on the idea that there's slow-moving structural change over time in the labor market, and so we'd only expect the, the NARO to move slowly over time. The trouble is we don't observe it. Uh, we nevertheless try to estimate um, uh, the NARO. I've given you an example here. And um, so the NARO, this, this is the, a plot of the NARO against um, the actual unemployment rate data. The NARO is the kind of black line in the middle. Um, and uh, a couple things stand out about this plot. Um, first is that the NARO, even though we think it's a, it's a structural variable, uh, most estimates, when you try and try and estimate the neighbor on the basis of, of the dynamics of pay, what you see is that uh, it, it's quite it, it's difficult to draw a line between what is cyclical and what is structural. So these estimates tend to pick up or could be picking up um, some cyclical factors as well. The second problem with 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 estimating the neighbor is that it's, it's subject to considerable statistical uncertainty, which uh, are the purple purple and these were meant to be red <laughs> dotted. Uh, the purple line at the top and the, and the black line at the bottom show you that um, 
right now in Nehru that's below three and around six is still within, within reasonable confidence bands. Um, and some models actually, this isn't the worst uh, that I've seen. Um, given the difficulties in estimating the Phillips curve, it makes, it makes a great deal of sense to look at other structural relationships in the labor market. Um, one such other relationship is the beverage curve. Uh, it's kind of the Phillips curve's neglected cousin, but still important. And what, what this is, it's a plot of, it shows the relationship between vacancies, unfilled labor demand, and the unemployment rate. And what I've shown here is a scatter plot of, of the more recent data over the latest business cycle phase. So the, the dark dots are the pre, pre well, the 2005 to 2012 data, so pre-recession and the beginning of, of, the, of the recession. As you can see, we had a very sharp drop in labor demand as unemployment rose. So the labor market was very slack at the bottom right of this scatter plot. And the lighter dots are the, the, um, the beverage curve during the recovery phase of the business cycle. So the labor market has tightened considerably. The ratio of vacancies to unemployment is a very standard measure of labor market tightness um, that we use. And what you can see now is that we have a higher vacancy rate. So as a proportion of the labor force, vacancies are higher than they were before, um, and a lower unemployment rate. So on this conventional measure of tightness, uh, the labor market is super tight, right? So what, what we'd expect when we look at this uh, data is that workers are transitioning, unemployed, unemployed workers are transitioning into employment at a fast pace. But when we measure, when we measure the, the outflow from unemployment to employment, it's really actually not that impressive once you condition on how tight the labor market is. And uh, that data is in the left panel over here, where you can see that um, <laughs> about 27% of all unemployed workers, um, unemployed people, transition into employment in the following quarter. That's roughly where it was at pre-crisis, but given how tight the labor market is, we would have expected this rate to be higher. So how can we, play, how can we explain low unemployment currently? Uh, that has a lot to do with the inflow into unemployment. So from employment to unemployment, that rate is actually lower than it was pre-crisis. And even though the scale here is quite small, um, on, the, on the second panel to the right, uh, this is the percentage of, of um, employed workers who flow into unemployment each quarter. So even a small percentage there, because it multiplies a big number of employed people, can have a big effect on the unemployment pool. And that's lower than it was uh, prior to the crisis. So what we've seen, what we see is kind of the pace of reallocation maybe slowing a bit in the labor market. Um, outflows from unemployment and inflows are, are a bit lower than they were before. Um, there's been a stream of work in the US as well that has pointed to declining fluidity in the labor market and has pointed to the adverse consequences that a decline in fluidity can have for wages and productivity. Um, finally, just briefly on a wider measure of slack, Torsten went into this already. Um, I have a similar chart here uh, which, it, which measures the net additional desired hours that people want to work. So what the, what the black line is here is um, netting out all the extra hours that, that some, peop, some employed people want to work against all the fewer hours that other people uh, who are employed want to work at, to come up with a net measure. Uh, so this is measure in measured in terms of hours. The, the interesting thing about this chart is that um, slack on this wider definition is uh, at zero, um, but the pre-crisis average was, was negative. Um, and so we have this question about where, where is the equilibrium at? So is there, is there a bit more slack on this measure? Um, should we expect uh, net desired hours to be negative at trend? Um, one potential explanation for that is the, work, the, the length of the work week is on a secular downward trend, right? And so the, the dark bars um, that are negative on this chart are for full-time workers. They tend to want to work less hours uh, than they currently are. Um, and so the, the, question, the question remains then, how much, how much slack uh, remains even on wider measures? As Torsten mentioned, we, um, we've already seen a lot of the adjustment even on wider measures of slack come through. Uh, so as you can see, there's, there's already been a fall even on um, this wider measure of underemployment. Um, and I think the other, when connecting underemployment to pay growth as well, we, uh, the, the other point I'd like to raise is that um, these measures are also highly correlated with headline unemployment. So it's quite difficult to, although you can disentangle the two effects, um, I think 
they're going in the same direction currently. We've seen we've seen um, Slack even on wider measures um, being used up as well. So those were all the comments I had to, to open the panel with. I think I'm going to uh, hand over back to the panel. Stephen, over to you. Uh, great, thank you a lot, Brad. I'm just going to pick up uh, on a couple of things that um, Brad was talking about and particularly talk about a little bit of work that we, Paul and I did in the paper trying to include some of those people who are on Brad's chart um, in our estimation of the Phillips curve and in our estimation of what wage growth could be. Um, so in particular, I'd like to stress that um, it's important to think of um, these people in some senses as resembling the unemployed. So we don't just want to include anyone who wants more hours. Um, saying that you'd like to work more hours in a job um, is all well and good, but actually um, the way we kind of measure unemployment is not just people who want to supply more labor, but who are actively trying to do so, so that they're actively searching for work. So what we want to do really is see, well, how important are these people? Um, there are a lot of people, there are a quite a high number, as Torsten said, so about 700,000 people at the moment in the UK are underemployed in the sense that they want more hours or they'd like to work full time um, because they're working part time at the moment and they're actually actively trying to do so. So um, that's the group we're interested in. Um, uh, to say a little bit more about them, uh, three quarters of those people work part time, perhaps um, unsurprisingly. Um, a fifth of those people are on temporary contracts, so they might be um, concerned that soon their temporary contract is going to run out and they, they'll be without a job or they're trying to look for work in the future, which is important. 15% um, of those people are unemployed, and there's been a really big rise in unemployment. Uh, sorry, not unemployment, uh, self employed. There's been a really big rise in self employment, and 15% of people who'd like to supply more hours are self-employed. 10% um, are on zero hours contracts, um, which is a group we've heard a lot about. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that as a share of the total labor force, uh, zero hours contracts are a very small group of people, about 2.8% on the most recent um, estimates. Um, and yet 10% uh, of this group are interested are, are on zero hours contracts. So you can see that they're much more prevalent among this um, group of underemployed people. And about 7% work through an agency. So again, could be concerns about future work um, and when that agency contract runs out. Um, so that's the group, and um, the group is, as I said, it looks a lot different to full-time employees, um, and they're much more likely to be searching for work, unsurprisingly. So um, if you're on a zero-hours contract, you're about 12 times as likely to be looking for additional work than if you're a full-time employee. Um, if you're a temporary worker, you're about eight times more likely. So we've got a group here that are um, underemployed, and they're very actively trying to find work. Um, and so what Paul and I do in the paper is try and include those people in our, in our measure of labor market slack um, as a distinct but similar group to the unemployed and see if, if you include these people, do we find this relationship between pay growth and slack, which um, according to some models and, and some data, as Brad showed, is kind of missing in the most recent period. And, and what we find is that if you include these people um, in this measure, the relationship between slack and pay growth is a lot stronger. Um, and Doing so means that kind of between the period 2014 and 2017, which is kind of when the latest um, good data on this is available, we estimate that including these people probably explains, as Torsten said, about a fifth of the puzzle of why wage growth was slow in the recovery period. Um, it's worth saying that they're, they're probably doing uh, less to explain wage, uh, the wage puzzle now, as Torsten said, um, but I do think there are two really important takeaways from the work, and the first is that we do need to include a these people in a broader measure of slack. Um, they do look a lot like the unemployed, as I said. They're trying to supply more labor, and they're actively doing so. Um, and therefore, including them is important. Um, I think doing so will give us a better handle on where the labor market is. Um, and it also seems to be particularly important when you're coming off the back of a recession um, to include these people. Um, and then the second thing that I think is really important is that we should, we should be more aware of this group just in general, because um, without wanting to perhaps future gaze too much, it's likely that unemployment was a pretty good measure of slack in our understanding of labor market in the days where majority of people work full time, eight um, hours a day, five days a week. Um, we know that over time, that's become a lot less common. There's been lots of talk of the gig economy, some of it overblown, but undoubtedly, we've seen moves towards, at least over the last course decade, to a more casualized um, labor market in which there is more people doing shift work, there is more people um, uh, working a social hours and so on. So as if those trends continue, which if, if you listen to some profits of kind of technology-based doom, that will continue, and I'm not sure that will be the case, but if we think some of these trends will continue, and I think in some senses they will, 
we need a better handle on the labor market and understanding people who are in work and underemployed and searching for work is the way to go about that. So thanks. And finally, Paul. Right. Um, I'm just going to make a, a few short points. Um, so uh, Brad sort of put something up about, um, about the natural rate or the Nehru sustainable rate of unemployment. And I just want to make sort of one observation, which is um, some people sort of seem to have an ex a, a, a view that if you push unemployment below the natural rate, uh, wages and inflation explode on you in some kind of dramatic fashion. Um, that's not uh, the case. Yeah, that uh, it's widely held in the 1960s that we had unemployment below the kind of natural rate back then. And inflation and wages grew in nominal terms by about 2% over the decade, yeah? In other words, if you're not massively below the natural rate, the expectation is for a slow and reasonably steady rise in inflation and wages rather than a dramatic explosion. So part of the story which we need to be had is that this takes a bit of a time to know where you are, yeah? Right? And the Bank of England has time to find out where it is. It's not going to be a panic. Yeah? It takes, uh, they've got, you, you will see it evolve, and you'll see it in sufficient time to take any kind of action if we are uh, pushing unemployment uh, too low. Um, and then, right, then I want to put on to this kind of uh, uh, wider slack kind of idea. Most vacancies in the economy, we saw the kind of unemployment vacancy relationship there, but most vacancies in the economy outside the bottom fifth of the pay distribution are not filled by the unemployed. Yeah? They're filled by job-to-job -job moves. Yeah? So the best characterization of the labor market is that the unemployed typically enter the labor market in the bottom fifth, the bottom third of the wage distribution into jobs which are relatively elevated in the proportion that are zero hours contracts, agency work, temporary work, part-time work, yeah? Uh, it didn't used to be the case that the entry wages, as uh, entry jobs had low hours back in the time when most people worked full-time. That wasn't the case. It is now. So the entry point is relatively low houred, yeah? And that the people entering into that segment of the labor market, the entry job section of the labor market, typically want to move on fairly quickly. Yeah? They are out of equilibrium. Yeah? That's not where they want to be. They're wanting to move on. So if you look at active job search by those in work, it is massively elevated amongst part-time workers, amongst zero-hour contract workers, agency workers, temporary workers, et cetera. That's the description of the labor market. So you have a sort of an entry point, and then you have progression, yeah? And the progression is pulling people up, uh, you know, up the distribution through uh, moving job-to-job -job kind of migration, okay? So unemployment and its relationship with typical wages is negotiated, if you like, or it's, it's mediated by what's happening in this kind of entry portion of the labor market, yeah? Because the pressure or the difficulty of filling vacancies at the median is not really about the unemployed, because that's not where they're coming from. It's the pulling up of people from lower down the distribution, yeah? What we show in the paper is that those entry point jobs, if you like, the actively looking for work to leave those positions, remain substantively elevated relative to the pre-crisis period. So the unemployed portion has shrunk to unusually low levels, but the employed exiting from the entry jobs further up the labor market portion is not unusually low. It's actually higher than it was pre-crisis, yeah? And particularly, what you're finding is a large proportion of people there saying they are offering more labor supply. They're actively looking for work and they're actively looking for work with more hours. Yeah? So they are offering labor supply increases. So the labor slack is somewhat higher, if you like. The, the unused labor share is, is higher than measured by unemployment alone. Okay? Uh, one sort of small aside on that, the, the measure that Brad put up uh, mitigated those who were wanting to want work more hours against those who were, want to say they want less. Those that say they want less hours do not look for work any differently than anybody else. It's not elevated, active job search. People don't expect to look for less hours by moving job. Yeah? 
right? They're looking for more hours by moving jobs, but they aren't looking for less hours. What they want is the same job, but working a bit less in it. And as I've just dropped my hours a day a week, I kind of know that story, <laughs> right? As I get close to retirement. Okay, so, they, so the process is not symmetric, is what I'm trying to say, right? So looking at the people who are saying they want more hours, they are looking for to move jobs and they are actively seeking. The people who say they want less hours are waiting to get close enough to retirement to drop an hour a, week, uh, a day a week like I have, yeah? They aren't symmetric processes, and that's why in some of the analysis that we do, we focus on the elevated job search part of the story rather than saying what hours you would like. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got one more point. <laughs> that, was, that was a swallowing, wasn't it? Right? Okay, so that's, that's in a sense, that's right, and that goes to some way to explain why, in a sense, they have a different cycle, is the other point, right? If they all moved in tandem, the, the on-the-job search and the unemployed job search moved in exact you know, parallel with each other, then there would be no, you know, no problem in terms of measuring it just through unemployment, but they don't, right? The unemployment stuff is bigger just after the crisis, the elevated job search of people who want more hours comes a little bit later when those unemployed people are moving back into the labour market and wanting to move on, yeah? So it's shadows, but it's shadows with a sort of a two or three year delay, right? So unemployment hitting lows, the labour search, if you like, on the job search is two or three years behind, and that's kind of where we are now. That's right. So I can finish on that bit. I just want to say one thing on productivity. Productivity and uh, wages are mutually linked. Yeah, they aren't clear processes by where one drives the other, right, in an ordered kind of process. As Torsten sort of showed in the kind of stuff, the early phase of the downturn was that we had big falls in wages which saved jobs and reduced productivity. In the early part of the recession, it was the wage fall because of the big devaluation which was pushing uh, uh, employment, holding employment up, but product pushing productivity down. Th at that point, it was wages first was driving the productivity story. Yeah, uh, but there is a sort of virtuous circle here: is that over time, the long time processes, productivity creates the earnings power within the economy for wages to rise. Rising wages creates the incentive for firms to invest in labour-saving technology because it's got more expensive, right? In that early phase, it got cheaper, and hence firms didn't invest heavily in labor-saving technology and productivity fell, yeah? The sec we've had a second Brexit devaluation and the same process is there. But Brexit may also be having an additional story, which is that it's damaging in current investment decisions by firms because of that kind of uncertainty. I'm not saying that's a definite, but it seems plausible. And certainly it's the case investment is chronically low for such a late stage in the mature part of an of a, of a upturn of a, a recovery. Yeah? Corporate investment is incredibly low given the state of the, state of the recovery. Yeah? It could well be that, in a sense, we've got a, an, an, an exogenous shock to investment going on right now. Now, maybe once we get Brexit sorted out and stories in the press are that we're getting closer, uh, that, that once that's sorted out, we'll get an investment surge, yeah? But I just want to sort of push a little bit against the idea it's productivity stupid, yeah? Because wages and productivity are linked, and which one drives which is, is, a mute, is not, you know, strictly ordered, right? They are mutually supporting, right? Our problem at the moment, if you like, is that the wage growth is unusually low, and with the devaluations, uh, uh, real wages are incre incredibly low. That's not giving firms big incentives to invest in, t in technology, right? And Brexit may be adding to that, which is causing us an, an additional problem. But we have, in a sense, we need to solve the two together, is what I'm saying, not just focus on one of them. We need to focus on both pushing wages and pushing investment, because we kind of need both to create to return to the virtuous kind of circle, um, which we've sort of lost. The engine of, of, of living standard rises is essentially almost stalled now, yeah? And we need to sort of pull on both bits if we're trying to move it, not just one of them. Okay, enough. Just before I th um, throw it open to questions from the floor, could I just pick up on that, that last point that you were touching on, Paul, and perhaps ask all of you? Um, Torsten, in his remarks, didn't talk about Brexit as being part of the story, but looking at the chart, the sort of the 0.7% average real earnings growth uh, since 2014 in part could be seen as quite a strong period of recovery, 
followed by a very weak period of wage growth in that period of imported inflation that Paul was talking about since the Brexit vote. I just wonder whether you could just say a bit about whether you think actually this, the Brexit vote has in some sense hidden what might have been a pay recovery as slack has um, diminished over the last year or so. Me? Do you Sorry, want to start uh, and then we can... Um, yes, up until... Um, I mean, yes, we had a second big devaluation. The second big devaluation... Wages don't respond to imported inflation shocks in the way they did in the 1970s when we had strong unions bargaining over real pay, right? So if you have a big imported inflation shock from a, a currency depreciation or, at right now, big push in commodity prices, oil prices rising, yeah, that, that erodes uh, real pay... Um, uh, but that should be coming to an end. It should be, you know, that should be easing out of the system, if you like. So it's it's caused a sort of a shadow effect, a bit like just after the crisis when there was a big devaluation. We should be moving out of it right now. Um, uh, so in a sense, we should be moving to normal. But normal doesn't look much better than one percent. Yeah, it's not the two percent which Torsten talked about pre-crisis. The kind of the normal at the moment, the productivity growth, you know, says it's probably about one, not two. Um, so, yes, but not all of it. Yeah. Brad, does the Bank of England have any thoughts on this? Well, um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I think it's... I'm not sure how much it changes the, the big picture. So what we've, what we've seen with, with pay is an improvement as the labour market tightened, and then it's been, been relatively stable. So um, it, it could uncertainty be, have been masking... Uh, an improvement that was set to come in pay is, is possible, but I think that the I think the bigger the bigger dynamic here is the one that was set out in the initial presentation about weak productivity. Thank you. Now, questions from the floor. Okay, well, Bill first. Could you say who you are and where you're from before you say, even if the panel know who you are? Sorry, Bill first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about, if you like, the history of the Phillips curve, um, because Alan Budd, after um, the recession in '92, did a review of all macro and microeconomics, which I was associated with, and we concluded that the Phillips curve was dead and that um, it had not worked since Phillips done it, basically. <laughs> and Nothing has changed since then, um, apart from the fact that we've lost that history. Um, and I, I just wonder whether we've been looking for explanations for things moving about, but everything just stays flat. Um, if you accept that the Phillips curve is dead or wages are sticky, then we don't have a low pay problem we have a high and variable inflation problem. And that was why, you know, given how sticky our wages were, there was an end to boom and bust. That was why stability in macroeconomic policy. So actually the sort of dovishness of the Bank of England seems to me to be the problem here. I mean, we've got a problem with sticky wages, but it could, it could act as as a good thing. If it is going to be one to three forever, then if you have inflation at 1%, then real wages go up. I mean, that was the conclusion at the end of 92. <coughs> and I don't understand why we've lost all that history. I'll gather a few questions uh, together, so go down here next. Um, <coughs> John, John Bryant, um, we're a very, very tiny company in Harrow. Um, one thing which none of the, the uh, uh, various uh, presentations have, has helped us with is the impact of migration in and out of the country by EU workers. And it would appear, anecdotally at least, that we think the flow of EU workers coming into the country is slowing. And then indeed, quite a few EU workers who have been here for a while are going back to their original countries, partly because of the inflation effect uh, that their pounds don't buy as many euros as they used to. So... Um, <coughs> Is that another factor that we ought to take account of in looking forward that whatever kind of Brexit deal we have, there will be fewer EU workers in the workplace at any level, whether it's in the uh, entry-level jobs or in, even in the uh, more middle-range jobs? Uh, and I 
lady in the middle there with the headscarf on? Yep. Thank you. My name is Ishita and I'm on work experience for the Department of Education. And my question is, what criticisms do you have on policy regarding the economy? If you personally were a policymaker, what re would you make to it? Um, great. Well, can I... I'll get you to answer those. So just um, to recap, uh, Bill claims that the Phillips curve has always been dead and we've just forgotten that. Um, John was talking about the migration impact. So I know uh, Alan Manning's going to be on the next panel and there's going to be a wider discussion of labour market uh, effects, but perhaps I could ask these panellists to talk about whether migration is one aspect of slack in the labour market that we perhaps uh, haven't been measuring properly. And then a uh, question about what recommendations would you have for policymakers? Um, so, Stephen, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, I'm happy to pick up the migration one. Um, without wanting to um, take anyone's lines from later on, um, I'll leave the kind of debate about um, kind of whether or not the effect that migration has on native wages, because I think that will probably be discussed in the next panel. But in terms of their contribution to slack, it's, it's kind of very difficult to fully estimate the contribution in the sense that if you, if you think about slack being based on people who want to supply more labor and who are actually trying to do so. In theory, if there's someone in Poland who'd like to supply more labor and they're actually trying to do so, they should be in included in our measure of slack. Now, obviously, we can't do that. What we can do is see the kind of share of jobs that are taken by relatively recently arrived migrants. And they, it varies with the cycle, but broadly speaking, over the last decade, um, about a tenth of all the jobs um, each quarter have been taken um, by a relatively newly arrived migrant compared to 90% being taken by um, British-based um, people who are here, who could be migrants as well, but um, people who haven't recently arrived in the country. Um, and so I, I think that gives you a sense of the scale um, of the effect. Um, and so, yes, they are an important contribution, um, but I think we'll probably hear more about the relationship with wages in the next panel. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'd broad, broadly echo what Stephen said on migration. Of course, it's a, it is uh, definitely an important channel for labour supply. I kind of, I kind of draw an analogy with people who are in the UK but outside of the labour force here to begin with. I mean, there are different characteristics, but there is, um, it goes in the same spirit of looking bro much more broadly than the current unemployment rate uh, when we're defining slack in the labour market. So. Yes, it, 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 it is something important to look at and it can have important influences here in the UK. Um, but we do have the second panel session on that. Um, maybe, maybe I'll address Bill's question about the death of the Phillips curve. Um, good morning, Bill. Thanks for your question. Um, you are right, of course, that I think the way that I would characterize um, Phillips curve estimation is there are certainly those who... who uh, share your opinion, but the way that I look at it from a practical perspective is that we, we should expect instability in aggregate macroeconomic relationships and um, the kind of, there's, the burden is on us to try and bring something out that's useful for policy. Um, I'm not quite sure I would go as far as saying that there's, there's no meaningful message that we can extract from the data on pay growth and um, the labor market uh, that would be useful for policy. So in, in that sense, I'm not, you know, has it shifted? Has it twisted? Has it flattened? Yes, this happens all the time. Uh, it's also not just the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve gets a lot of attention um, in macroeconomics, but uh, the beverage curve, as I was describing before, is also one, is also one in which there, there's instability over time when you look at the aggregate data. Um, and what we're seeing now is a lot of recent work is the kind of work that um, Stephen and Paul have done, for example, is you go beyond the aggregate data. So we're not just looking at headline pay growth and headline unemployment, but a lot of the more recent work now goes into a much, um, much more detailed and granular uh, dive into the data to try and say something helpful about um, these relationships. And Paul, do you want to take the, the last question about recommendations? Ooh, okay. Um, can I do Bill as well? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, because I'll start with Bill, because that was in the top of my head. Um, so when you're looking at the aggregate macro relationship between unemployment wages, there's lots of other stuff going on, which we've talked about, inflation shocks, productivity shocks, 
uh, if you're looking at mean wages, things are influenced by minimum wages. Certainly what's happening to top bankers' pay is not about unemployment. There are lots of other moving parts, if you like, right? Which is why we want to look at the relationship at a subnational relationship, so regional, using regional data. Where, so the aggregate shocks are the same and we can take them out in the data, but we can look at the relationship between unemployment wages within the country as parts of the country move relative to each other in terms of unemployment and see what happens to wages. What we show in the paper is that there was a strong and stable relationship between wages and unemployment over all of the kind of data which we have modern unemployment measures for. So in that sense, the Phillips curve is alive. I want, to, I, want to sort of, I want to get too much into what exactly the Phillips curve is, but the relationship between unemployment and wage growth is there. Uh, it's struggling in the last two or three years, right? And it's kind of, and, and so if you look at, the mo look at it, how it's changed over time, the last few years have knocked the stuffing out of that relationship. But as we show that we seem to believe that some of that is because why the slack is not being included. And if you do so, the relationship remains. It's probably come down a little bit in strength, but it's not zero. Yeah. Unemployment wages do respond to labor market slack at a regional level. Yeah. And that relationship is there, and it's reasonably strong and reasonably stable. Yeah. Fine. Policy kind of stuff. So. Um, so there's lots of policy things which we can talk about which have sort of come out of this kind of stuff, right? The first is what would be really cool would be to have a currency appreciation, yeah? What's likely to do that? Well, in my view, a good trade deal, yeah? If we sort Brexit with good trading relationships, the big devaluation after the, after the Brexit vote was because the markets took the view that our trading position had deteriorated and the relative value of sterling therefore had to fall in order to, for us to continue to be trading on, on equal terms, if you like. Yeah. If we sort that out with a decent kind of deal, and I'm not sure whether that's Canada with 10 pluses or, or um, uh, keeping uh, an open market for all goods, I would probably form in favor of the latter. But whatever we do, if we do a good deal, we should see some form of currency appreciation. Yeah. So, and that would do some positive to this kind of thing, right? It's only, only temporary, because it only sort of happens once, but it would raise our living standards. <laughs> but let's talk about the other kind of stuff. So, so Torsten also highlighted, and something which I don't think gets enough attention, is that uh, human capital development, you're, you're in the Department of Education, so I'm going to talk about education, yeah? Uh, there was a massive expansion of universities for cohorts born in the 1970s who were attending universities in the 1990s. It has stopped for a decade, yeah? There's no more, almost no more kids going to university now than 10 years ago, yeah? The big expansion, if you like, of, of human capital has more or less stopped. Now, we have raised the school leaving age, yeah, from 16 to 18. It's doubtful whether that's doing any bleeding good, yeah? Because as far as we can tell is that the, the, the people, what's happening is there's more kids staying in school than going into the labor market at 16, so they're losing labor market experience for resitting exams two or three times, yeah? So what the net evaluation, the net effect of reduced labor market experience of people who uh, generally leave school with low qualifications relative to doing a few resits and maybe getting your GCSEs in maths and English on the third or fifth tape, yeah? What the net effect of that is on their wages and their productivity uh, is, is, is questionable at least, yeah? So we need to think again, if you like, about restarting educational investment, yeah? Now, that could be universities, but it doesn't have to be, yeah? There are other routes, yeah? We've always talked about can we get a technical route to organized apprenticeships. The apprenticeship levy doesn't seem to have boosted apprenticeships for 18 to 24-year-olds in any significant numbers, yeah? We've introduced a levy, but it isn't working in what we kind of want it to do. So we are in a policy space where the recent initiatives don't seem to have been positive for the story of boosting educational participation, and we need to revisit that. Okay, so that's kind of point two. Closely connected to it is, is the occupational upgrading. The other story that seems to be going on is that young people aren't progressing in the labor market to higher levels of occupation uh, and skill as rapidly as my generation did, yeah? 
And it's kind of when I reached the sort of the high paying sort of plateau of, uh, of through promotions, you know, at sort of 35 or so on, it's taking kids longer to get there now, yeah? And so we need to start thinking about, if you like, how we get progression in the labor market for young people. We're seeing a lot of graduates in relatively low skilled jobs for a relatively long period of time after graduation, yeah? We need to start thinking about those kind of processes. And just finally, because I can't not say it, because I used to sit on the Social Mobility Commission, the big problem is around those from relatively deprived backgrounds not progressing in education and not progressing in the labor market as rapidly as other groups, and as they could, and as their potential and talent could be made to happen. I'm really sorry, but the uh, flashing clock on the desk tells me that we are already over time, I'm afraid. Sorry, I've talked too much. Um, could I just ask each panelist to kind of wrap up with a very short comment, and particularly could I ask you to reflect on whether is the relation, is unemployment such an uninformative measure now of labour market slack and pressures on prices that the Bank of England should just stop looking at it at all? And if so, what measure should they be looking at instead? Brad, do you want to start off? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think, I think the, a lot of what we've just discussed, um, if, we, if we're looking back a few years ago or a couple of years ago, there was there was genuine uncertainty about um, how much, how puzzling is the behavior in pay growth and ha has it become disconnected from um, headline unemployment. Uh, I think now the more data that we get and the more time goes on, the more that we can see on various different measures that um, slack in the labor market is, is drying up and the labor market is extremely tight. And the, the kind of, the big variable now that's, um, holding back pay growth is likely to be productivity. And so the more, the more data that we get, the more time goes on, I think attention will, will shift onto that. Um, whether or not we should stop looking at unemployment altogether, I think so my, my, the view that I hold, and this isn't representing the committee's views, um, is that, uh, yeah, we should, we should do our best to kind of infer from, to extract what we can from the data that we have. And, a lot, of, a, lo a lot of the more modern research, which we've just seen in an example of today, goes, goes far beyond the kind of simple single equation um, aggregate Phillips curves that we, we, we used to have in the past. And so I, th I think it's actually still quite, quite an exciting uh, literature to, to be a part of. Stephen. Um, I suppose just two points. One, I would definitely agree with broadening measures of slack, and I think the bank already does it a lot. And, you know, it's not just about the unemployment rate. Um, and then the secondly, just to pick up on the point about policy, I think one of the things that came out from the research is, you know, the, the group that we've been focusing on, the 700,000 people, um, you know, that is a group that is amenable to policy change. And I think that, you know, um, one thing that could help the situation is taking action to improve the bargaining power in terms of, you know, giving people on zero-hours contracts more rights to move on to a regular contract, you know, sh sharpen... Um, blunting some of the sharper practice around agency workers and so on. And, and I think that in itself will have ramifications when the next crisis hits because it could be that the, the, the burden is, is improportionately borne by people on those, um, in those temporary contracts when the next crisis hits. So. Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about the unemployment bit because we've sort of done that. I'm going to touch on Bill's other point, which I, I didn't address, which is the bit that, that's kind of interesting me a, a little bit at the moment is, is, is about in the inflation part of the story. So when we look at real wage movements, we sort of say, we look at the relationship between wages and inflation. The evidence seems to be suggesting that there has been a disconnect, if you like, between wage growth and imported inflation, yeah? That's the kind of story out of those big devaluations and so on. Um, I think that we could sort of think about that a little bit more widely, is, is what is the relationship between nominal pay and, and inflation, and is it always the same for all forms of inflation shocks? That, uh, that move the economy. And I suspect, well, I, I believe they're not, but I think that's where some of the interest should be, in a sense, is about what does pay respond to in terms of inflation, what parts of inflation, if you like, does it respond to. Thank you very much. Well, Stephen's comment definitely leads very nicely onto the next panel about all the other reasons that pay growth may have been quite so weak. So could you please join me in thanking all the panellists?